Hello, and welcome to the Fundamentals of Loop Playing. My name is Loudon Shewitt. Today we're going to talk about the basics of right hand techniques. So we won't go into really even intermediate level um, loop techniques. We are going to just talk about what we need to play our very first piece, which is going to be a single line treble. Uh, so we are going to work on single notes today. We will start off with the thumb under technique. We'll also cover a thumb out. And we'll talk a bit of it about the uh, controversial M and I alternation. And I think the important thing for everyone to remember is that in the 16th century, there wasn't a single right hand technique. The thumb under technique was the dominant technique, but there were other techniques that were being used. And in fact, there were still plectrums being used. People were putting plectrums on their fingers of play, like Francesco da Milano. We know that by the end of the century, in some manuscript sources like Calvel Conti, we have M and I alternation. We know that John Doland, in the middle of his life, changed from thumb under to thumb out. So there are a variety of right hand techniques that are available to you as a Renaissance lute player. We are going to cover some options in the context of playing a single line. So you've got your lute in front of you. And let's we're going to start off a little bit with uh, thumb under, and we're going to talk about how that sort of developed. Now, the lute is a descendant of the oud, and the oud is generally played with a plectrum, uh, usually a, a feather or a piece of leather or ivory or other things have been used, but a plectrum is just something that you pluck with. Today, a plectrum would be called a pick, so some of you may be coming from the guitar background, you're used to thinking about playing with a pick. A common plectrum that was used in the 15th century and 16th century uh, would be a bird feather. Some of you may be wondering where I got this. I have a yellow naped Amazon parrot named Tico who's uh, lived with me for 27 years. Um, so we were just kind of chugging along and he uh, molts. And when he molts, I collect the, the feathers. And this is one of those, but this can also be used as a plectrum. If I really were to get into it, I would probably shape the end a little bit more and, and do a few things. But so 15th century lutenists and some 16th century lutenists were using these plectrums. And at some point toward the end of the 15th century, players started to experiment with dropping the plectrum and using the fingers. And what you may have noticed when I was using either the pick or the feather is that I've got my pinky resting and then my arm is moving. I've got a down pluck. So I'm going like this, down, up, down, up, down, up. The same digit, the plectrum is being used to pluck in both directions and my arm is moving up and down like this. So when they dropped the feather, the fingers open up a little bit um, and the thumb and fingers stay in sort of the same position. And you'll notice when I pluck, and I'll, we'll go into greater detail here in a second, but when I pluck with my thumb, it goes underneath the index finger, hence thumb under. So this technique was the dominant technique of the 16th century, particularly the first half, maybe first three-fourths of the 16th century. This really is the most common uh, lute technique. And when we talk about lute technique, this is often what people mean. Um, so if you are a Renaissance lute player and your goal is to learn how to play thumb under, um, this is going to be a good place to start. Now, if you haven't seen my video on sitting positions, I would definitely go check that out. It's episode two. Um, sitting positions are related to what right hand technique you're going to use. And if you've got a good understanding of those different positions, it could be very, very helpful for this video. Um, the position I'm using right now is just my right leg crossed over my left. No footstools are being used, and I'm resting the lute here on the right leg. This is a good position for me for thumb under. Um, the neck is a little bit more horizontal. I do tend to like it tilted up more than some players do. Maybe it's my guitar background. Um, maybe it's just my body. Um, but you can play around with if you'd like to have the neck a little lower, a little higher. It, it's a, you know depends on your body and your comfort. So something to experiment with. Now, the pinky, what we're gonna to wanna to do with the pinky 
is we're going to take the side of it. I generally find the, the side is best for me. You may have an unusual pinky and you may think, oh, I need to, to use the tip. You'll have to play around a little bit. Just make sure it's not twisting the wrist. So we do want a straight wrist and sitting in front of a mirror can be very helpful for this. So if you catch yourself doing something like this, we need to make sure that that's not happening. So if you have a straight wrist, then you're gonna put your pinky down onto the soundboard. And one thing you'll notice is that my lute isn't straight up and down. I've actually got it tilted back just a little bit. So there's a slope and that helps support the pinky. And then what this pinky is gonna do in the same way that it did for the plectrum is it's gonna stop the hand from moving down. You know, if I were to not have the pinky there, the thumb would just go and the whole hand would move down. And you, you get a nice sound for that individual note but then you have to come all the way back up and you have to find that string again. So it's a lot of wasted time and energy. So that pinky, when we put it down, stops the hand from moving. Do that. Now, what I'm gonna have you do is I want you to take a look at your thumb. And I think one mistake that beginners often make is they put too much of their thumb on the string. So I want you to take a look at your thumb and what we want is just the left edge as you're looking at it. So if you're looking at your nail, you're gonna be looking at the left side of your thumb and we want just that little bit to touch, that little bit of flesh. And if you've got long nails, you may want to cut them. If you can't cut them because you're a classical guitar player, you might have to think about the shaping a little bit. Um, thumb out also tends to work a little bit better with nails. So if you're a player with nails, you may want to jump ahead in the video and look at the thumb out section. Um, so what I'm going to have you do is you're going to put your pinky down and then I'm going to have you place your thumb, just that, that left side, onto the chanterelle, the single string. If uh, you don't know your terms, I did make a video on loop terms. That's a good one to check out. So you're going to put your thumb on the chanterelle and then you're going to gently press toward the soundboard a little bit. And then you're going to push through toward the ground. So a little bit down and a little bit through. So into the soundboard, down to the ground. So in, down, in, down. And you'll notice I didn't attach any worksheets or reading. We're going to do a lesson on how to read tablature for this lesson and the next lesson on left hand technique, I really want you guys sitting and just being with the instrument for a little while. It's very often people get their, their instrument and they sit down and they just want to start playing something and they want to look at something. And I think I want you to spend a little time with just the instrument. And so you're listening to the sound you make. So pluck, so you're going to push into the string and down to the floor and listen to the sound you're making. and make sure that it's a sound that you enjoy hearing. And you're gonna just do this over and over in a quiet space. And then when you're ready, move to the second course. Now, it's generally a good idea to hit both strings in a course. Um, you're gonna get the best sound out of that. I will be honest, I don't know of any sources that explicitly state that you should always hit both strings in a course and that that is essential. But I think um, from, from a sort of modern perspective of playing the lute, it really is a better sound if you can get both strings. Um, if you're having trouble telling whether you have both strings or not, you can actually detune one of them and then you'll hear they're out of tune. I actually changed um, a string on my F course recently. <laughs> It's a little out of tune. I'll do it on purpose. So we'll knock this one a little bit out of tune. There we go. So I'm going to hit this fourth chorus F. And you can hear that it's out of tune. And that means I'm hitting both strings. If I were to just hit one, or if I were to hit the other, you can hear that it actually doesn't sound as bad. But when I hit both, we go. Now I'm going to fix that. There. So it'll drive me nuts if I leave that out of tune. But um, we want that for each course. So just take your time with your thumb playing each course and getting used 
just striking both strings at the same time. And when you're playing double strings, it's the same thing. You're pushing a little bit into the instrument, and then pushing down. And you'll hear when you get to the, the courses that have octaves, you'll hear both strings. And if I were only playing the fundamental, the low note, you would hear it's kind of got a hollow. And if I were just playing the octave, hear that. But when I play both, all the way down. Now for classical guitarists, um, I know that some lute players in some contexts will use the thumb rest stroke. The only source I know of where the thumb actually does a rest stroke is some vihuela sources where they talk about if you play a bass note and your next bass note happens to be on the next string, you can slip through the, the, the course and play the next. But rest stroke as a sort of fundamental technique um, that you do all the time is not really described in the sources as far as I know. Um, last I checked. So what we're really talking about is free stroke with the thumb all the way down even in the bases. And if you've got a small hand or if you just are feeling uncomfortable as you go down, this is going to be even more true when we add the index finger. You can move the pinky and you may want to spend some time getting comfortable moving the pinky up and down to give yourself easier access. This is going to really be true if you have more courses like seven, eight, nine, ten. You know, a six course lute isn't going to be too bad. You might have to move your pinky a little bit. It's generally okay if the pinky hits the chanterelle and it touches, as long as you don't need to play something on that string. It's totally fine. So once you've got the thumb sounding as good as you can get it, nothing's going to be perfect at, at this stage. You're just going to be playing and listening. Now we're going to try the index finger. And the index finger, you're going to end up with a little bit more of the pad. Um, I think this is different for everybody, though, so I would be ready to experiment a little bit because the shapes of our fingers are so different. I mean, if you're a guitar player and you know Julian Bream and you look at his fingertips, they're completely different than John Williams. They're completely different than Segovia. Um, it's going to be the same thing with lute players, whether you're Nigel North or Paul O'Dead or Hopkins and Smith. So I think what you're going to have to do with the index is you're going to figure out that spot on the tip of your, your, your index finger where you can get a sound that's as rich as the thumb. And in this case, my index finger is pushing the string up toward the ceiling. So there isn't as much pushing in and down. Um, there may be some players that like to do that. I find that to be a little awkward. I find that the direction is more primarily toward the ceiling or up. So I'm getting, let me see if I can get a good line on my finger. I might not be able to on this. I'll have to do it on the guitar. It has a little higher tension. But um, it'll cut right across the pad of the finger like that. So I'll demonstrate again. So we've got index. And you'll see the index fingers going over the thumb like this. And we, we know that in Renaissance music, they alternated between strong plucks and weak plucks. So the thumb would be strong using gravity and going down to the floor and index would be weak. Um, and you can get that effect by simply not, uh, by simply letting the natural order of things occur. So if I were to just play the thumb and I were to play the index, the index is a little bit lighter. For now though, I want you to try to match the thumb so that you have the maximum range with your index finger. I also think this is gonna help when we start playing chords or multiple notes, because often the index finger can be a little weak. It's usually a, a middle note in a chord and it doesn't come out quite as clear. I know that's always been a challenge for me, getting chords nice and clear. So. For now, work on having that index finger sound as good, as rich, and round as the thumb. Now, some of you may notice where my hand is placed on the instrument, and a lot of people get hung up on this. They think, okay, well, the hand needs to be here on the rose, the hand needs to be over here, the hand needs to be there. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, uh, every instrument I play, my hand is actually in a different spot. Happens to be on this six course lute, on this chair, at this height, in this sitting position, I'm a little bit over the rose 
like this. I just, this is where it ends up. When I've played a 10 course lute or a theorbo, my hand might be a little bit behind the rows, might be a little bit more forward. Um, I don't, there really isn't, I think the, be the best way to put it is you need to use your ear and you need to experiment and find where you get the best sound. And if you're an absolute beginner, you may not know what the best sound is. So asking your teacher or a more experienced friend, record yourself and listen back. Um, you're gonna get a lot of things wrong and you're gonna change your opinion a million times down this road. So don't worry so much about getting it perfect now, but do experiment, play around. Like, do you like the sound here versus here versus here? Find that spot. For me, it's right here with, with thumb under. So you're gonna take that index finger and then you're gonna to go to the second course. Do the same thing. And again, you're trying to hit both courses. Making your way down. And I find in particular when my index finger needs to move down here, my pinky definitely needs to kind of come up. And with thumb under technique, the index finger will spend a fair amount of time down in the bases. If you're playing early repertoire like spinachino, dalza, caparola, uh, even milano slightly later and things like that, you are going to have that thumb and index alternation down in the bass. Later with John Doland and, and things like that, um, they tend to emphasize the thumb doing everything, even the faster notes in the bass. In fact, in the variety of lute lessons, um, the Bassard translation that they use says, use the thumb even with 16th notes. Once you're comfortable with the index finger, then you're going to alternate. So thumb, index, thumb, index, and then change strings. you'll notice the pinky moved a little bit and then when you come back up allow the pinky to slide back down I usually find that there's kind of two positions for me they're sort of here and a little bit farther up on this instrument um, the next thing to actually practice so you'll notice I was doing four plucks per string there That means that the thumb is always leading when you change strings or cross strings. Um, the next thing to practice is, is three notes on a string. So go thumb, index, thumb, and then you switch on index. Index, thumb, index, switch on thumb, thumb, index, thumb, and then you go index, thumb, index, thumb, index, all the way down and back up. So you're getting used to the two different ways you're gonna cross. You're either gonna cross with your thumb or you're gonna cross with your index. Now there'll be times um, in the future when it gets a little more complicated and we cross with maybe our middle finger or even our ring finger as a, as a possibility. But for now, we are focused on our fundamental technique. And when we're playing this slowly, You'll notice that my arm is doing most of the work here. It's just going down, up. And when I pluck down with the thumb, and I come back up with the index finger, it brings the thumb with it, so that it's ready to do the next hit. And when I change strings, I just make sure that my last pluck on the higher string, so I go pluck, 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 and when I pluck with that index finger, I go a little further and bring the thumb to the second string. And what you'll notice as you speed up is that the motions get a little smaller. And a little, uh, uh, the distances between everything kind of shrinks. And that's that's the big thing. Um, and we're not going to worry about speeding up right now at all. Um, that's going to be down the road. But really the idea is all you're doing when you speed up is making sure that you're not allowing the fingers to get as far away from the string. If they stay close to the string, 
then you can bring them back faster. And we'll go, we'll have a whole video on dealing with speed and all of that. I've had to think about that a lot as a, as a student and as a player. Um, so that's going to be our basic right hand technique for thumb under. Uh, for those of you who are exploring later repertoire or maybe guitarist, or maybe you just like thumb out technique, um, let's talk a little bit about the thumb out position. So I like to use the double foot stools for the thumb out position. Again, if you didn't watch the sitting position video, that's a good place to start. I have the left foot stool a little higher, the right foot stool a little bit lower. Um, I don't tend to use the strap um, when I am doing this. You might want to put some shelf liners if you if you want there. But here it's um, very similar. The neck is angled a little bit higher. Um, this is going to be a position that is perhaps more appropriate for repertoire like uh, John Doland, uh, certainly Valet, Ballard, Daniel Batchelor, things like that. Um, things where there are more than six courses in particular, like a 10 course lute. I know a lot of people like to get the 10 course lute to play all sorts of different things. Um, when I put the pinky down in thumb out position, I find at least that I end up using a little bit more of the tip. Now the thumb out comes from the fact that with thumb under, we had the thumb kind of underneath that index finger. In this case, we're going to throw it out. And that's the way they describe it. If you read the variety of lute lessons, it's, you know, extend your thumb as far as you can. Um, and again, we're going to go through the same process. I find that in this position, I'm a little bit more behind the rows. Uh, and what we're going to do is we just start off with that thumb. We're still plucking on that left edge that I described earlier. And we're still using the arm. It's just instead of it this way, we're going a little more like this. And we're still watching the wrist. We don't want the wrist to be angled this way or this way. We want it nice and straight. And we'll talk about um, tension versus poise versus being absolutely relaxed um, in, in future episodes as well. But we want that position there. We're gonna just practice our thumb. down just like we did before going slowly and listening you might find that thumb out has a slightly brighter quality to it particularly when you get to the index finger so what you're going to do is you do the same goal with the index finger my video on tuning you know that sometimes it's a it's a hassle to keep a new string where it's supposed to be at especially in uh, unusual weather um, the index finger I would practice as much as you can using the index finger on the fifth and sixth course but remember again at, at this point um, you're going to mostly be using the thumb in the bass and they recommend using the thumb even for 16th note runs now if it's a particularly fast piece and you just really need, it's gonna be much easier with P&I, then I would just be absolutely comfortable with letting that pinky come up against the chanterelle so you give yourself as much space as possible. And just work on your contact points. But I do find it more challenging and that most of the time, I'd say 98% of the time, you can get away with just Using thumb and getting used to plucking that fast for those those runs. Um, the primary elements are the same though. We're using the pinky as a as a sort of brace to stop the hand from moving. Um, it does give you, I think, maybe a little more uh, reach with the thumb and reach in a way that it, to me is more comfortable. So if I'm playing a 10 course lute, this is more comfortable to me than when I'm thumb under and my thumb is going back like this. So I do think that that is advantageous when you have uh, eight, nine, 10 courses. Um, the final thing to talk about is the M and I alternation. This is very controversial, but 
it, you have to understand that we we do have some sources that include M and I alternation. They were doing it. Um, Cafe Conti is in 1591. By the time we get to Valet in Secret of Muses, he's fingered a number of his pieces very, very carefully, and we know that he used M and I alternation, um, at least in the pieces he fingered very carefully. He annoyingly didn't do it for the rest. I think of them as examples for the rest. Some people think of them as exceptions. I think you're going to have to come to your own decision there, but it existed. And I will warn you, if you decide to use MNI as your primary method of alternation, your middle and index, you're going to get some pushback from the community uh, because people like to think of this is Renaissance lute technique, this is Baroque lute technique, and you got to be right next to that bridge. That's, that's what the evidence says, and that's all it is. And the, the reality is that it's more complicated, it's more nuanced than that. Um, MNI use will probably get you the most comments. And people will say, well, it's not a guitar, it's a lute. But you can defend yourself as long as you know that there was Cavalcanti and Valet and look, there's evidence that they were using MNI. And I always like to say that if something is in writing, it's probably been happening for a while before it ended on the page. So I wouldn't be surprised if MNI alternation on the lute was occurring at least in the 1580s. We know Vihuela players many decades earlier were already describing MNI and it was well liked by Vihuela players. It was, it was known for being a very clear, nice uh, technique. So my recommendation, which is a little different than the classical guitar MNI alternation or INM on classical guitar, um, is that you primarily use the pinky as your support. If you find that that's not enough, you can always brace with the thumb on another string and do this. I find that that kind of limits the, the angle of attack, so you, you don't get quite as good tone. So if you can find a way to mostly use just your pinky as the support, And M finger, the M finger is going to be our lead finger. So this is the stronger digit. People will often say, well, what do you mean? Isn't the, the pointer finger the stronger? If you ever pinched somebody and you really wanted to get them, you know that you use your thumb and your middle finger. If you use your thumb and your index, it's just not going to work. This is a stronger digit. Uh, and that's the reality of it. So we want to use our middle finger as our leading finger. So we're going to use that on one and three. One. And it may be that in faster passages, you want to rest your thumb for a little extra security. Um, it's just going to depend on your um, your hand. And I've experimented with M and I for a while. I, I played with it. Um, I like the tone in a lot of places. Uh, it didn't have the feel that I necessarily associate with Renaissance music. So I, I've ended up kind of going back to thumb and index, but don't be shamed. If it ends up working for you, I've actually seen some phenomenal m and uh, playing out there at, at the professional level. And it can be used for thumb under as well. That's not something I've experimented with as much. When you use it in the thumb under position, in particular, the middle finger, I, I find sounds better when you pluck on the right side. So if you're looking at your nail, it would be the right side for you. So actually kind of swooping in a little bit from underneath. And then the index is about the same. Now, the reason I haven't used this as much in thumb under is I just really like the, the thumb and index alternation. But I have seen players um, playing with... Uh, M and I in a thumb under position and to, to excellent effect. So those are your three basic hand positions. There are other things that lute players did in the 16th century. Like I said, they continued to use plectrum. They, 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 we know that Francesco de Milano actually was putting thimbles with little feathers on the end as finger plectrums. Um, we know that they were very experimental. So there, there are a few other kind of avant-garde things that people were doing, but those three basic ideas, the thumb under position, the thumb out position, the M and I alternation in either context, that's going to get you um, a, a lot. It's going to get you through a lot of material. Our, like I said, in the next few episodes, we're going to start working on our first piece, which is a single line piece. A single line piece is just playing one note at a time.
And once we've completed that piece, we'll work on a more complicated single line piece and then eventually start adding more notes uh, at the same time. So adding chords in, for example. And talking about, well, what fingers do we do when we play chords? So that'll be the next, uh, as we do lessons, I'll sort of add on to the right hand technique video series. And we'll do the same thing with the left hand. The next episode will be on how to play single lines with the left hand. I just thought this would be the most efficient way to learn step by step instead of throwing everything at you guys in a single lesson and hoping that you'll just go back and refer to it. I thought we'll just do it in a sequential way um, and spend some time really just enjoying playing single line or single voiced. That's the other word we'll use for line uh, music. And I think it's such a great fundamental part of playing the lute, even more so than the guitar, because so much of the lute repertoire has these runs, these single lines, whether you're it's ensemble or whether it's solo. So getting comfortable with this is going to be very important. Um, it is impossible to cover everything in a video, I'm finding. So if people have questions, uh, comments, they want to have a few things clarified, put it in the comment section. Um, Obviously, we are mostly helping very beginners at this point, but we're going to keep advancing. So if you're a more advanced student and you're like, oh, well, what about this? And I'll go, well, I, my intention was to talk about that in a few episodes. Um, so I hope you find this useful. If you want to keep up on these videos, uh, do make sure you like and subscribe. And I will see you in the next video, which will cover uh, basic left hand technique or single line left hand technique. Happy looting and have a wonderful day. See you next time.